Hi everyone, this is uh, Anastasia De Santos at the USAID Office of Trade and Regulatory Reform. Welcome to our Market Links uh, seminar on growing small and medium enterprises and what works. Um, today we're really going to focus on high growth small and medium enterprises and we want to present evidence to you um, that it's, which is still emerging, but we have a decent amount now on what works and what doesn't for high growth small and medium enterprises in our host countries. And USAID really focuses on using theories of change in our program cycle as these helpful visual models with articulated causal steps and assumptions um, to lay things out in project design. We wanted to organize evidence around these theories of change for your convenience and, and articulate how we expect um, our inputs to relate to different outcomes, especially um, if you can move to it, do I? How do I advance the slide? Down, down. Sorry, technological challenge here. This one. Whoops. This one. Um, and really linking our different interventions to the outcomes that we all care about and. And for aid, these are really our standard outcome indicators under EG.5 for the sales and full-time equivalent employment of our beneficiary firms. So in order to really help us um, inform today's discussion, I realize we, we stopped doing the pre-poll, but if, for those of you who completed them, that will really help us uh, document that we're presenting uh, in interesting information to you. So, so why the focus on... Um, theories of change. Uh, it's really because um, we tend to, I think we will use these partly because we're forced to when we're designing projects, but we don't always go back to them and they tend to just sort of sit on a shelf after the project's awarded or you've written your work plan. Um, but really we should be going back and checking our theories of change against new evidence regularly and learning and adapting um, in real time. So that's why we really wanted to present the evidence this way. And we know that with what we're going to look at, um, targeting continues to be a really important challenge, but uh, we don't have uh, enough evidence on this yet. So with that, I'd like to introduce today's speakers, um, starting with Natalie, who's really going to present the sort of uh, international evidence. Natalie Shemwell is a manager at the Inclusive Markets Practice at Resonance. And prior to joining residents, she also worked for um, other development consulting firms. So, um, and Natalie has degrees from American and Clemson. Is the audio working now, folks? Hmm. Yes, and the captioner. Great. So, and then after Natalie presents, we'll have Ron Ashkin to really talk about more uh, practical experience uh, using theories of change, guiding project implementation. And Ron is an international economist. He's currently serving as project director on USAID's Linkages for Small and Medium Enterprises project in Vietnam. And he has degrees from Harvard and Wharton. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Natalie. Thanks, Anastasia. And thank you to the, the Market Links team for um, hosting and organizing this presentation. I'm excited to be here and present some of our research today. So as we know, SMEs are extremely important to the economies of emerging markets. They make up the majority of enterprises, account for a substantial share of GDP, and employ a significant portion of the workforce. So sustainable economies um, and sustainable economic growth and job creation in emerging markets can rely heavily on a competitive and robust SME ecosystem. So because of this importance, policymakers, donors, and practitioners have designed and implemented initiatives and programs focused on a range of SME development activities, 
However, despite the popularity of these programs, we as practitioners do not always articulate our clear, clear theoretical frameworks. Um, so as Anastasia referenced, we don't always articulate our theories of change clearly, and we, we don't always outline the variables linking SME growth with clear assumptions. So with our research, and the report that we developed, we have attempted to organize a variety of theories of change related to SME growth, provide a comprehensive account of published or publicly available research and studies on SME development, and present an overview of the interventions that are most effective in spurring SME growth. So here you can see the research questions that we attempted to answer through our report. Uh, what evidence exists that demonstrates the impact of different SME development interventions and growth outcomes, and what is the level of, uh, level of rigor of that evidence. So here you can see a quick snapshot of the methodology that we used for our report. Um, in, we also conducted a number of interviews with researchers and USAID and donor experts in the field of SME development. And then towards the end of our desk research, we also organized a donor roundtable to discuss and validate an initial set of findings and implications that we identified through our research. In organizing our research, we, as Anastasia was saying, we divided the um, SME development interventions into uh, five theory of change categories. These are the categories, you can see them listed here. So business management, so this includes um, training, direct consulting services, and then matching grants for training or consulting services. Uh, access to finance, which includes access to credit initiatives, such as subsidized loans, credit guarantees, and changes to collateral lending systems. Business registration and taxes, so business registration and formalization, uh, changes in tax policies or changes in tax administration, which affects SMEs. Market access, including a discussion around domestic market linkages, as well as export promotion. And then the final category was innovation, um, specifically focused on support to product innovation. Here you can see a high level summary of the findings of our research, showing the level of evidence and the level of impact for each intervention type using this kind of stoplight <coughs> color coding system. Um, so for level of evidence, we have a range from weak to strong, and then for the level of impact, you can see a range from low to high. So this gives a great visualization of, of all of our findings and the entirety of our research. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go in depth today about all of the specific theories of change listed here, but I will cover um, four theories of change in the, in the presentation today, including business registration, market linkages, um, training and consulting services. In the report, we go into a, a lot more detail about contextual factors, debates and critiques, and gaps in the evidence. Uh, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm only going to overview, give an overview of the issue area, the intervention uh, results, and then um, recommendations for each of these four theories of change. So the first category is business registration. A majority of SMEs in developing countries operate informally and are not registered with their national or local government, nor do they pay taxes. In addition to an opportunity for local governments to increase tax revenue, formalization can also make SMEs eligible to supply to formal markets, access government-sponsored business development services, and allow for bank accounts and loans to be opened in the firm's name rather than the owner's name. So as a result of this, governments, donors, and development practitioners have implemented a number of interventions with the goal of transitioning informal firms to the formal sector. These interventions include supporting policy reforms and supporting the simplification of the registration process. I'm going to run briefly through three theories of change related to business registration. The first is related to accessing formal markets, with the idea that if the time and cost to register a business is lowered, then SMEs will register, they will gain access to formal markets, increasing their sales, and therefore increasing profits or employment. 
Here you can see the second theory of change, which is related to gaining access to formal business services provided by governments or formal institutions. So if the time and cost to register a business is lowered, then SMEs will register, they gain access to formal services, which leads them to changing their business practices, which eventually leads to an increase in profits or employment through an increase in sale or cost efficiency. Here is the final theory of change related to business registration. As you can see, this is slightly more complex than the other two. Um, but this shows that if the time and cost to register a business is lowered, then SMEs will register, they gain access to finance, which allows them to purchase needed services or equipment, leading to an eventual increase in profits or employment. As shown earlier, here are the level of evidence and level of impact results for the aggregate of, business of the business registration theories of change. You can see the level of evidence is weak and the level of impact is low. So in general, there is a lack of evidence around business registration interventions, but what we were able to find showed that it is really unclear whether interventions to encourage formalization actually, actually lead to increased growth. So there's, there was only one example that we found in the literature which links formalization with an increase in profits. And in this example, only a small, small, small subset of the sample actually demonstrated any growth at all. So since the benefits of SME participation in the formal versus informal sector is not fully understood, and research hasn't yet validated whether formalization leads to SME growth, uh, donors working on SME development programs should carefully analyze all possible outcomes of formalization on SMEs before investing in policy reforms that reduce business registration constraints for SMEs or SME development programs that encourage formalization. So now moving on to market linkages. Reaching new markets, either domestic or international, can provide SMEs with opportunities to scale, but entering these markets can be a huge challenge for them. SMEs often struggle to access information about market opportunities, and many market opportunities are often out of reach for SMEs due to high quality standard requirements. In addition, potential larger client firms are not, don't really know how to easily find these SMEs that meet their needs. So here's the theory of change framework for the market link approach. According to the literature, support for the development of long-term business relationships between SME suppliers and larger buyer firms positively benefits both the SME and the larger buyer firm. So SMEs can achieve a stable market for their products and services while the large buyer firm expand their base of suppliers and are able to supply them with quality products and services. One additional popular theory is that market linkages incentivize SMEs to learn more and improve their product and their business practices. So that's why you can see here those intermediate results, which show, are shown in the theory of change graphic. But there is limited research on the reality of this um, upgrading response among the SMEs. You can also see in this theory of change the demand side intervention represented. This is when a program works with a larger firm to engage with and build the capacity of SME suppliers directly. So through these programs, large firms contribute to strengthening the management and technical skills of SME suppliers according to the areas that the large firms wish to develop. So here are the specific level of evidence and level of impact results for the aggregate market linkage theories of change. Um, you can see the level of evidence is moderate with the level of impact as high. The evidence suggests that market linkages programs increase SME sales and employment and positively affect their sustainability. So in the case of the buyer firm, a market linkages approach contributes to increased sales and positively affects their ability to export. Although the link between market linkages programs and SME growth is strong, as we showed here, the research shows that when a large firm is simply connected to or matched with a local SME, the underlying problems are not likely to be resolved. Larger buyer firms often complain that local SMEs continue to lack the information, experience, and the human and financial resources to implement and manage the technical changes required to do business with these larger firms, and they find that SME products or services continue to not meet their procurement standards. So even when a large buyer connects with an SME, the SME may still lack the capacity and the ability to complete orders um, on time and at cost, 
and might still continue to not be able to meet those quality requirements. So as I mentioned, linkages approach, market linkages approaches are shown to have positive impact on SME growth, but simple information sharing or matchmaking programs between SME suppliers and larger buyer firms may not be sufficient because they don't address some of the underlying capacity issues that large firms identify in local SMEs. So when we're thinking about designing market linkages programs, donors and practitioners should really consider exploring the demand side capacity building interventions which are supported or sponsored by larger firms. So on to the final category, which is business management. Studies show that a lack of managerial skills and capacity among SME employees and leadership constitutes a significant constraint to firm growth and that management skills are a major determinant of productivity. So one common theory among development practitioners is that building the capacity of SME owners and employees will improve the performance of their enterprises if they acquire new skills, leading to an increase in demand for labor and additional sales revenue and employment generation. So under this category, I'm going to talk through two theories of change related to business management capacity building. The first is training. So I think a lot of people are familiar with training interventions. Training has become one of the most common forms of support provided by donor interventions to SME owners and employees to improve their business practices, core management and administrative functions, or even technical skills. So here you can see the theory is that if SME owners receive training, then they change business practices, which leads to an increase in sales or cost efficiency, and therefore increasing their profits or employment. The second theory of change is related to consulting services. You can see that the consulting services um, intervention has a very similar theory of change to training, but they differ in, in the input. So standard training, they differ from standard training in that the technical assistance is typically customized to the firm and their specific needs. So although the process may vary, generally consulting service interventions are carried out in a two-phase process. The first is consultants generate a diagnostic report or an assessment report that evaluates the firm's existing management structure and output, and then consultants implement a consulting plan that advises managers and firm employees how to improve their processes or their capacities within their company. Here are the specific level of evidence and the level of impact results for both of the training and the consulting services theories of change. Um, you can see here that the level of evidence for both is strong. There's a number of interventions that use these theories of change. These are often used within um, development programs, and they've also been quite well researched, um, including the impact that these types of interventions have on the SME growth. So randomized control trials of business training courses found low results in terms of impact on SME performance. but Similar studies on consulting services showed a much stronger link to SME growth. The cost of delivering training can be expensive relative to other interventions, and the results of training interventions are, as we've seen, mixed at best. So donors and practitioners should consider assessing whether a training intervention is actually truly necessary before implementing training activities. However, consulting services can also be very expensive, but as discussed, consulting services are much more likely to yield an impact on SME growth over standard training programs. So these are just a few of the theories of change which we review in our report. There's a lot more, there's a lot more detail and nuance um, in our report, and uh, I encourage you to download it and read through it. Um, we have a lot more information on contextual factors and program assumptions that would go into these types of theoretical frameworks. I do want to take just a few minutes to review the high-level recommendations we present in the report. Uh, the first is do what we know works. So we, as um, Anastasia mentioned in her introduction, we want to make sure that we're selecting interventions based on the research. We want to make sure that the interventions we're developing have a proven um, impact and a proven impact on SME growth. So for example, there's, as we discussed, there's strong evidence that consulting services have a high impact on SME growth in profit or employment, 
so donors should consider supporting these interventions over training interventions. The second recommendation is carry out context-relevant project design. So when we're developing projects, we should really start with an assessment to understand the actual constraints to SME growth in that context, the demands of new or growing SMEs, as well as the characteristics of the targeted SMEs and the SME owners. And then we want to appropriately, appropriately articulate that theory of change. So as Anastasia was saying, we want to make sure that we're appropriately laying out all of our assumptions, clearly identifying our target beneficiaries, and evaluating the aspects of the theory of change that have not previously been well researched. Take cost effectiveness into consideration. Project design should also consider the trade-offs between cost and impact of specific interventions on the target group and only adopt the most cost-effective intervention, so those that are proven to have an impact. We need to conduct additional research. So one large finding from our report is that there are ample opportunities for more research evidence in, and evidence in each of the theory of change categories that we discuss in our report. And then there are a number of other areas within the research that need to be covered, so specific um, impacts of interventions on different um, demographic groups or different types of, in different types of economies. So there's a lot more research that could be done, and I think it would really help um, this area of expertise and help us in designing um, more impactful SME growth programs. So really encourage you to download our report and review um, all the research that we've done and see the additional detail and nuance that we've um, included there. Thanks. And now, thank you very much, Natalie. And now we're going to hand it over to Ron to give his presentation. In the meantime, folks, we are definitely keeping track of all your questions. Please keep them coming, and then we'll try to go through them uh, in the Q&A part. OK, great. Thanks, Anastasia. Uh, Natalie, thank you for that. And I hope everyone uh, is ready to listen to a, a different perspective, which is an uh, implementer's perspective. So I'm going to talk about USAID's Linkages for Small and Medium Enterprises project, which is in Vietnam. We started in late 2018. Uh, this first slide just shows what our contract purpose is. So our contract purpose is systemic changes in business relationships between Vietnamese SMEs and foreign firms. And then we're supposed to create significant increases in business linkages. And the theory of change assumes that by linking SMEs, that they'll become part of global value chain. Okay, and, and our objectives basically are to strengthen the foreign firm and SME business linkage framework and enhance capacity in, in five sectors. So that's what our contract says. Now, this is the summary table from Natalie's report showing all the different intervention categories and types, levels of evidence, levels of impact. Well, here's where Link SME sits. We only do two things. We do consulting services, we do market linkages. And if you look at the table, uh, both of the activities that we do have evidence to create high levels of impact. So th this project was designed uh, in, in alignment with the findings of the report. Again, we only do two things. We do market linkages, we do consulting services, and out of that, we actually create economic value for SMEs and, and the Vietnamese economy. And from strengthening local supply chain, we get a multiplier effect for more local content. Out of that, we also learn lessons so we can replicate and scale, and we give lessons to the policy level, to the government of Vietnam. So re really fairly simple project design, and it's based on what actually works. And yeah, I actually didn't, didn't compare presentations to Natalie beforehand, and, and we came up with the same conclusion. Basically, do what works. What is Link SME? Basically, we're USAID-funded supply chain consulting firm. 
And again, our mission is to deepen Vietnamese local content for foreign firms that serve the global marketplace. It's a faster way to connect Vietnamese SMEs to the global market than, than direct export. So basically, we're a B2B project, not a B2C project. And again, we facilitate linkages. We're bottom up. Uh, this Michael Porter says value is created at the enterprise level, so we work at, at the enterprise level. We're measured by the linkages we create, so we actually have to create more than just matchmaking. And again, as Natalie said, just putting firms together is not enough. We follow them through the entire transaction. So we don't just define a linkage as making the match. We also do TA for supplier development. Product has to be manufactured, it has to be delivered and accepted, and the SME has to get paid. At the point we introduce the SME, they go through the entire cycle deliver and get paid, then we can mark up a, a linkage on our scoreboard. We operate because our services are not free. They're actually quite expensive. Again, as Natalie pointed out, consulting can be quite expensive, but it's effective. But, but we don't give services for free. We want something back. We want data so we can collect evidence on what works. Okay, and then we're paid by a third party, USA. And we also consider value for money. Value for money is effectiveness, efficiency, and economy. So again, uh, apologies, Natalie, we didn't compare notes beforehand, but we ended up in the same plane. We think like a business, we're a private sector organization, we're implementing a private sector development program, so we have to think like our, our beneficiaries. We use quantitative targets to define our success, and we spend our budget so we can get value for money. So the principles we run the project on, customer focus, we use a process approach. So we don't make up ad hoc interventions as we go. We use a process, but it actually comes out with different outcomes for each company we deal with. We have a mandate in our contract called CLA, Collaboration, Learning and Adapting. That's part of our contract. And we have to understand private sector incentives. We do use intervention logic. I prefer to use intervention logic rather than theory of change because we work with real companies who are not theoreticians or practitioners. But theory of change, intervention logic, development hypothesis, in my mind, are interchangeable. So as long as you have logic behind what you do, you can do things properly. Um, but basically, things should be clear and simple. They have to be understandable to all stakeholders, not, not just M&E specialists. Our logic should explain why we're doing what we're doing and, and link our activities down at the bottom to the impact at the top. And there should always be a strong causal relationship between what we do and what the intended purpose of the project is. And in our case, it's to create more and better linkages. So what that means is all of our activities, no matter what we do, should lead to more SME foreign firm linkages. And if they don't, we don't do them. So whether we do what are called events or partnerships or consulting or training or trade fairs, they should all lead to linkages. So they don't, we don't do them. And we map them out in a results chain. The results chain generates a measurement plan. That's how we gather evidence. And then we use evidence to both measure our success and to inform our ad adaptations. That way we can be more effective. That's, that's our collaboration learning and adaptation mandate. Uh, I borrowed this slide from DCED. It's, it's my favorite M&E slide. But a lot of projects are still run this way. You know, we had great results. All the participants we gave money to rated us a big success. It's kind of, we're, we're measuring the wrong thing. You know, I wonder on this slide, what happened to the one that we gave money to that didn't like us? Like, what did we do wrong? You know, obviously, if you give free money away, people should like you. But that's not an impact measure. And we've all seen this before. You know, basically, if you look on the web about a lot of development work, our project trained 50 people. And we created a thousand jobs. Okay, so you know I've seen this lots and lots of times. The question I ask is how. And here's how. Tinkerbell flies in, and a miracle happens. You know, if you don't use logic behind your design, you know you're kind of hoping a miracle happens. But actually, there is a way to design practical intervention logic into your project. So we start with accurate problem definition. We do inputs. In our case, we deliver TA to partners. We try to address systemic market issues at root cause level. 
And at that point, we step out. That's what the dotted line is. That's where the market takes them. So we facilitate. Market activity takes over. There should be an output from our input. The output is that our partners gain some capacity they didn't have before. And it has to be because of our assistance. Next, there should be an outcome. Those are actually changes that sh in behavior that show up in the marketplace. And it's because of the new capacity our partners gain from us. From that comes impact. In our case, because there's changed business behavior, the quantity and quality of SME foreign firm linkages in Vietnam increase. So it's pretty simple. Uh, I like to use simple, understandable logic uh, and avoid kind of what I call the spaghetti bowl, where, where the only person who understands your results chain is the one who drew it. Um, and, and we turn this into kind of a, a you know a practical form, which I'll show you in a minute. But again, guiding what we do in terms of measuring our results. Again, these are just management truisms. You can't manage what you don't measure. If you didn't document it, it didn't happen. These things come straight out of the factory. Uh, you know, my favorite Zen proverb, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears it, did it make a sound? If you don't document it, maybe it didn't happen. We embed our measurements into our daily work. We don't like to do lots and lots of after the fact surveys and measurements. We actually check progress at each step of the process. You know, we don't build the car and inspect it after it's built. We check at every step. And we try to verify what's essential, no more, no less. Uh, you know, we, we actually only have seven contract indicators in Link SME. And we see there are many more indicators, but those are not our contract deliverables. They're, they're things we use to learn, adapt, and, and manage interventions. Uh, we try to use existing business indicators and not invent new ones because our partners have to give us the data. And we make that data collection a mandatory partner obligation. So we don't go out and collect afterwards. Partners know beforehand that part of the deal is to have to give us data. Okay, and we integrate M&E in, into the intervention process. Our intervention managers, our linkage managers are part of the M&E process. We don't use our M&E department as, as a policeman that comes in after. Um, again, we use a results chain that's based on DCED standard. The link is on this slide, and I believe there's also a link uh, you know, within the chat room. And pay we pay attention to a couple things. Attribution matters. There has to be cause and effect. Can we logically ascribe what happens to our project? So we don't want to claim attribution for something that had nothing to do with us. Second, is there additionality? We're actually doing something the partner would not have done without us. In other words, we're not just paying the partner's bills. And here, here's the practical tool that I've developed that we use. I call it the results chain cheat sheet. It basically shows the four steps from input to impact and asks practical questions that people in the field can answer. So what do we do for the partner? What capacity does the partner gain? What cha changes happen that are attributed to our assistance? What's the end result? And then we fill that out for each intervention and we sketch out how to measure. So here's one filled in for a sample intervention that Link SME did early in the project. We supported the Vietnam Chamber of Commerce and Industry to hold a supply chain event in one of the southern provinces. And just to measure our inputs, we just kept track of the number of SMEs attended. Uh, we wanted the SMEs to understand the benefits of participating in the project because our intent was just to get companies in the system. How do we measure that they actually understood a certain, we track the number of SMEs that registered online. So we have an online registration system. Um, next, we want changes to actually happen. So we wanted SMEs to link to foreign firms, understand what they need, upgrade and become suppliers. How could we measure that? We could count the number of SMEs that are considered for foreign firm requests for quotations. And finally, the impact, the end result is that SMEs actually supply product to foreign firms. And we can measure that by counting the number of values of orders produced, delivered and paid that are attributable to SMEs that we gave assistance to. So that's just a practical way of, of applying logic in the field. Um, I wanna talk about expenditure real quickly because you wonder, well, what does that mean? Because to get value for money, how do you spend your money? So to develop the market system, we're trying to be a catalyst, not a market player. So we'll pay for catalytic activities and try to avoid paying for transactions for assets. So on the left-hand side, these are things that we considered good spends. On the right-hand side, 
four steps. So development activities are capacity building, TA, matchmaking, referrals, piloting, market intelligence. We don't like to spend money on things like capital investment, construction, staff costs, equipment, inputs, paying sitting fees. Those are things that, that don't create sustainability or scale or systemic impact. Uh, yeah, and on expenditure, just some things to think about. Are we just paying the partner's bills for them? Would they have done it anyway? Are we actually building capacity to do it in the future? Um, if so, how are we doing that? Does our expenditure contribute to systemic change or does it just solve the partner's business problems for today? Uh, did we actually conduct a thorough problem definition or root cause analysis to make sure we're addressing the right issues? Or do we just accept the partner's wish list and if we step away, is the partner on the road to end that? So those things you should think about. Those are some practical questions you can ask before you spend the money. Um, practical experience and value for money are put into a table. Like what has high value for money, moderate value for money, low value for money. So you get the most value for money out of using local long-term TA. So I like using local technical staff to get out in the field. It builds local capacity. We reach more beneficiaries. Trade exhibitions have proven to be cost effective, uh, matchmaking events. And when we work with partners, when they actually target our group, but we only work in two sectors. We work in the electronics sector. We work in the metal sector. So if we do a trade exhi exhibition or matchmaking event, it's much more effective if we do one with partners just in our sector rather than a general export fair or general trade fair. Um, what gives us moderate value for money if we use local consultants externally, short term? And what's the lowest value for money way to spend money? Well, I'm an expat, but excuse me, you know, expat short term assignments where we fly people in and out to do TA, especially when they get long, is too expensive. Well, expensive venues, sometimes when I look at how we spend our money, we're spending a lot of money just on the venue. And, and our development money goes to the hotel or the travel agent, not to the beneficiary. Untargeted events, you know, just general trade fairs or general exhibitions that have people from every sector, whether you're working in it or not. And finally, partner wish list. The partner just comes to you with an idea. It wasn't in your work plan. It's not logical. It doesn't have sound theory of change behind it, but you feel like, well, they're our partner. We have to do it, and you pay their bill. It's a poor way to spend your money. Uh, we actually try to monetize value for money and just calculate input over impact. So, and as an illustration, because we're early in the project, we're running events to recruit SMEs into our database. We can simply calculate how much do we spend on the event by the number of registrations it gains. So that's the cost per registration. And then we can compare that between the different partners we work with and the different channels we work. We can determine or learn the most effective channels and the best partners to work with. Simple calculation. Um, just a note on building sustainability, you have to distinguish who you work with. There's a difference between partners and vendors. So all the time uh, you establish partnerships, but actually you're just paying the partner's bills for them. So a partner actually shares a mutual objective with you. How do you define that? At minimum, they must coincide with one of your top line development objectives. In our case, it's creating global value chain linkages and changing the system. So if our partner also wants to create value chain linkages, if they want to change the linkage system, you know, we can work with them. Uh, a partner contributes resources. They don't just take resources. And we like to cost share our activities and, and we start at 50-50. So we're not starting by paying everything and, and trying to wean the partner off our money. We start at a cost share. And, you know, with, with a partner, you're actually building sustainability through self-reliance. That's one of USAID's worldwide goals, building self-reliance. Okay. Um, a vendor, a vendor basically has a purely economic objective. It's just an exchange of value. They'll want to give you a product or service and you give them money. So it's a transaction orientation. There's no cost share. You're supposed to pay for everything. Ultimately, our role is just to pay the bill. And, and that's, that's how you don't reach sustainability. That's why when you shut down after five years, nothing happens. We have to start another project. Couple of thoughts on impact because the study that we saw right before me talks about level of evidence and level of impact. Um, so yeah, impact has to be evidence, not just illustrated. I see a lot of projects that have success stories, 
The success stories are just anecdotes. They're not results measurement. It, it illustrates what should be backed up by evidence. And, and the methodology matters. So you do have to have a robust methodology behind how you gather evidence. Um, and just to come down to earth for a minute, your intervention may create impact, but is it sustainable? I mean, and at the end of the day, we're doing development. Development has to stay after we leave. So we can create impact, but do we just buy our impact? It's, it's always possible to buy impact. That, that's why you see pilots everywhere and then no scale. With a pilot, you buy your impact and magically with Tinkerbell, it's supposed to scale up. But, but I call that old school development. There's no theory of change. There. Basically, it means we had a target, we bought our target, and when we went away, it went away too. Okay, so, so then you have to consider is the impact scalable and system one? Right, if we can pilot linkages for 10 firms, but that doesn't affect the entire Vietnamese economy. We have to figure out how that pilot of 10 can go to 1,000. Okay, so is there a methodology behind that or we just expect Tinkerbell to fly in? And finally, again, reinforcing one of Natalie's points, did we consider value for money? Or did, did we write a success story, but behind the scenes, we spent a million dollars, we created 100,000 in impact. So consider value for money. Do that simple calculation. How much did you spend for the impact you got? Uh, quick takeaways. I'm ending where the presentation started before me. Do what works. Don't do what you think might work. Base your inventions on sound evidence. And if it didn't work in the past, don't think it's going to work in the future. So, you, you know, in the donor world, we've gone through different trends, you know, the business enabling environment, the BDS, the cluster, I can, I can name all of them for the last 20 years. What happened to those trends? So, so if there's certain interventions that didn't work for the last 20 years, why do we think it's going to work in year 21? You know, just quit doing it. Um, second, sound logic is key. Your logic should be obvious to a third party observer, not to an M&E specialist. You know, you, you should be able to talk to someone that doesn't really understand development and explain what you're doing. They should understand and, and avoid that leap of faith when you get from outcome to impact. You know, for example, uh, financial sector deepening leads to poverty reduction. That's my favorite leap of faith. We can show that we can get poor people banked, but we can't show that that actually makes them less poor. So don't just put that on your results chain and expect it to happen. Um, next, go from anecdote to evidence. What we want in development is evidence. We've got enough anecdotes, but success stories are a communications tool. They're illustrations. They're not a substitute for a proxy for M&E. For think like a business, um, SME development programs are a certain type of development programming, and we need to leverage private sector investment. So we have to understand private, center th private sector thinking, private sector incentives. Think sustainability, distinguish your vendors and your partners, build sustainability in from the beginning. Don't wait until you're about to close the project and think about a sustainability plan. Do it every day from the beginning. It comes from transferring capacity to local partners. They have to have a stake in the game. And you can always buy impact. We shouldn't do that. So number six, avoid pilotitis. OK, anyone can do a pilot, but one off impact is not evident. We want to work for scale. The challenge is to prove that the system can change, not that we can do a pilot. And finally, firms create value. So to create value at the enterprise level, you have to work with evidence. You can't just create a business environment because business is great value. So SME performance comes from engaging directly with SME. So these are all of our contacts uh, from USA Vietnam and from my project. Uh, thank you for listening and look forward to your questions. All right, thanks very much, Ron. Um, we have a ton of questions, so I'm gonna try to sort of organize them, but please bear with me here. In the meantime, I just want to remind everyone that we do have two links on the sort of bottom left of your screen. Um, one link is to the slide deck in this presentation, and the other is the link to the full report. And the link to the full report um, on the theories of change and evidence, are all uh, that link is also on the event page for the seminar, and you can always go back to that page after this event to download it. So um, with that, I want to start with um, a couple of the earlier questions, and I want to um, give both Natalie and Ron the chance to answer them as they would like. Um, the first is sort of a, a group of questions around formality and uh, regulation. 
Um, one question had to do with why we consider the benefits to be uncertain. Um, and I, I think actually it's a conceptually related question is how many of these firms are actually family businesses and they face other constraints that we haven't looked at to growing. And that is also related I, in my mind to the targeting question that folks have raised, you know, to what extent does this evidence or experience, is it really specific to certain types of businesses, whether it's the sector or industry or the size or who the manager is? And then uh, one question is also uh, related to formality and regulations in, in the implementation of it and the cost to the government, uh, but also the cost to the business. For example, tax taxation, which is often cited as a top reason that businesses don't want to formalize, wouldn't it be cheaper for basically the business to buy off the official rather than register? So I'm going to let... Um, Perhaps Natalie go first, um, but then Ron, if you want to chime in afterwards, just quickly. Yeah, so I guess related to the question around um, benefit to formalization, I think, you know, we talked through some of those, some of what those benefits are, you know, access to finance, access to formal business development services, access to formal markets. So I think there's clear, it's clear that there are benefits that exist when um, as an SME enters the formal sector. But I think what is unclear and kind of what we lay out in our report is that the link between formalization and SME growth specifically is unclear. So there are benefits that um, SMEs gain by entering the formal market, but whether that leads to SME growth is not clear in the, re in the research. And so I think that's the part that's uncertain um, around formalization. On family businesses, um, we didn't find or come across a lot of information on family businesses. There is one impact evaluation that's out there on women-owned businesses, and it talks about um, family relationships and how that can affect SME growth. So there are some interesting demographic factors that, that come into play when we're talking about um, family businesses, especially when we're talking about women-owned businesses and the dynamics that that creates. Um, on the targeting piece, I think you know, we set out at the beginning of the research and the beginning of the development of the report to um, identify what those high growth SMEs look like. And um, obviously we should be targeting those high growth SMEs if possible, because going back to our point on cost effectiveness, we can target the businesses that are gonna grow the most. I think that's gonna be the most cost effective approach. But I think when, what we found in the research was that there actually is not a lot of research on who these high growth SMEs are and how to, how to identify them. So that's definitely a gap in the research that we identify in our report. I think there have been attempts to think through characteristics or um, different types of diagnostics to identify those high growth SMEs, but I think all of that research is still kind of in its early stages. Um, did I cover all, I think I covered the majority of the questions. I don't know if Ron has um, things to add. Okay. Well, I do want to add. There you go. Well, I do want to add one thing on the sort of um, informality, which is the approach to sort of stay in business. Um, and, and and yes, indeed, there actually is a World Bank study. I forgot the exact title, but it's by Mary Hallward Grime Meyer and uh, her co-author. And there's the word deals is in the title. Basically, they find that yes, a lot of these sort of marginal businesses where they're sort of right at the cost of growth where it might make sense for them to formalize and when they're trying to figure it out, they think, you know what, I'm just going to cut deals on the side, especially in contexts where the implementation of the regulation is uncertain. So it's not just what's on the books, it's, it's the certainty and predictability of the outcome. And if it's uncertain, they, the businesses being entrepreneurial see that there's a chance for them to, to save money. They cut their own side deal, basically hire a fixer, and they don't have to register. Um, next, I'd like to um, go to um, a, a very important set of questions about validity of these uh, studies. Uh, we started to touch on it, but also um, in terms of the kinds of firms we studied, like the size and the gender of the owner, but also the context, different countries, different markets, and then also implementation fidelity, meaning you know what types of trainers were these, for example, or 
or what kind of bank did you partner with and does that matter for whether the findings are really relevant to what you're trying to design um, and I think we could maybe organize that with with a targeting question um, you know how in diagnostic question again how might impact do you think it would be totally different for a different kind of business and and then the question of diagnostics when you're on the ground uh, when you want to apply maybe some of this evidence but how do you diagnose what kind of firm you're looking at how do you identify different challenges and address them so maybe this time i will start with ron to give him a fair chance okay uh how do i identify challenges our, our project's quite different uh usaid vietnam has never done a project like this before it's totally bottom-up driven so we're basically like a startup supply chain consultant firm and the issue we're dealing with is that there's huge foreign direct investment in Vietnam, but most of the foreign firms export, but they also import their supply chain. So there's very little local content in Vietnam compared to regional economies, and, and especially compared to you know, China, the Asian China. So Vietnam wants to grow its middle class by having more SME participation. So we basically start out with, with nothing. We have to identify foreign firms invested in Vietnam that want to deepen their supply chain. Then we have to identify SMEs that are capable of supplying certain products. So, so everything is, is totally demand driven, 100% demand driven. So how are the, you know, so the, the basis is an economic basis and there was a study done, a baseline study before we started about what the essential issues are. So the essential issues in Vietnam is that the money's here, the investment is here, but the SMEs are not capable of supply. Foreign firms come in, they want to shift supply chain from another area, but they can't get what they need in Vietnam, neither quality nor quantity. So it was identified that the technical capacity of companies was the main constraint. Uh, again, learning as we go, and I've seen some of the comments, it's true. You can't just fix the factory. You have to also work on access to finance. You have to work on marketing and just global supply chain perspective, how global firms operate. So we're actually broadening out as we learn. Um, but we started out by identifying foreign firms that had specific requirements. Because the way this project is financed is that the companies finance themselves. We just provide technical assistance. So we find foreign firms that want to deepen supply chain. They identify specific products they need. And we then identify SMEs that are capable of supplying. We put them together. If they do come to a commercial deal, we'll then do a ISO based audit and do a capacity upgrade. So, so the, the types of, of problems we find tend to be shop floor oriented, but not always. I mean, I have a financial background, so I, I always know there's a finance problem behind it. Um, so we're, we're looking at that also. Um, but the, the problems at this point are actually unique to the firm. So in our first phase, we work with firms to learn what the problems are and how, how we can effectively address them. And the value gets created because the linkages create economic exchange. So the companies actually invest their own money in, in the upgrade. So if a company needs an ISO certification, for example, they have to pay for it. The, the finance is provided by the fact that they actually have an order at the end of the road. Okay, so, so it's kind of a unique project that the next phase will expand into more sectors. And in the third phase, it's more policy oriented or institutionalizing the system that we've learned and, and what reforms are necessary to make it easier for the company. So, yeah, how do we identify the, pro the problems? It's basically a, uh, you know, a problem definition or, or an analysis of, of each firm, and then we aggregate that data. So, so that's how we do it. Um, I think in terms of the validity of studies question, I think a lot of the, the research that we reviewed were impact evaluations. They were impact evaluations by donor agencies and research institutes. So we were pulling impact data and impact information to aggregate research. Um, there is a full list of the research documents that we reviewed um, as an annex to our, our report. So the full list of documents can be seen there. And then we also have kind of um, a system of um, level showing the level of validity of each of those studies. So that can be found in the annex for our report. 
Um, in terms of different demographic factors, in each, in the report, in each of the theories of change categories that we discuss, um, we do have a section on context and demographic factors. Um, we talk about gender and age differences, age of the business, and things like that. However, we did find that these kind of demographic differences were a large gap in the evidence. There's not a lot of research differentiating the impact of um, these types of interventions on different demographic factors. So gender of the owner, age of the owner, um, age of the business, or where the business is in the life cycle, um, and things like that. So um, that, that is a big gap in the evidence and, and definitely warrants more research. But we do discuss those factors um, within, within our report. And, and I would just add to that that uh, I can't remember who, which maybe randomista gave this quote, but external validity is the Achilles heel of impact evaluation. So I would say they are not valid for anything that you can, you can imagine is, is different and you can imagine how it's completely different is in a different sector, in a different country where they have different lenders or different host governments, different regulations, different implementation. I would say we should be very conservative about validity, which I know doesn't help you. But on the other hand, I, I would just encourage you to look closely at the studies. Um, I mean, in, with lack of better evidence, I think if you look at the study and identify ways in which their sample firms were, are similar to your target population or the context is similar to your target population, I think that you already will have identified the most rigorous evidence uh, for your theory of change. I think that's a that's a uh, just a key point to make about the report is what we've done is attempted to generalize something that's obviously very context specific. So we do talk about different program assumptions in our report and what the assumptions um, are when we we put these theories of change and these theoretical frameworks together. Um, but we do you know caution that what we've done is kind of generalize the evidence and generalize the finding and research that's out there to something that obviously needs to be context specific. Um, next, I'd like to address a very popular question, um, actually to do with gender and women-owned businesses. And if, if Natalie doesn't mind, I just want to go ahead and take that. Um, the basic problem there is a lot of the evidence out there on women-owned businesses is on micro-enterprises. Um, and, and that is why, by and large, uh, the study doesn't really, is not able to say anything uh, based on evidence on what's different and what might work differently for women-owned SMEs that are growing. Um, that said, I think we do uh, cite a couple of studies, including one USAID one, and which found that it is important to consider the household intra-household decision dynamics. And oftentimes we have other goals for those SMEs besides just growing them. We also want to improve the women's decision-making power. And we realize that even at the SME level, you can't take that for granted, and you need to offer parallel interventions to address that issue. I do want to point you all, uh, after that caveat, I want to point everyone to a, a brand new uh, report from the World Bank's Africa Gender Innovation Lab called Profiting from Parity. I did not think ahead to post the link, but you can Google that. It's called Profiting from Parity, P-A-R-I-T-Y. And they do a very nice summary of the evidence out there. Again, the problem is more than half of it is on micro firms. So not really what we were interested in looking at today, but they do uh, look at some small firms and some startups. So if you go to that report, they have a very nice chart uh, table showing, kind of similar to ours, what's the level and strength of evidence, as well as the conclusions based on the type of firm. Um, I don't know if you want to add any. No, I think that's right. And I think, you know, like we said, that's a big, a big gap in the evidence that we lay out in the report. And with that, I want to sort of hand it back to Ron. You have, Ron, I hope you can see several questions for you in the chat box. Um, I think you yeah. started to answer Crystal Planning's question about how you, you arrived at the focus, the very clear cut focus on linkages. But I am interested to hear did you get pressure to add on more interventions since you've started the project? And then some oh, other questions uh, about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I've been following the chat box, um, making some notes to myself. Um, I want to talk about that because it's interesting because I, I just came to Vietnam to start this project from another project that I, I call a kitchen sink project. So it's on another USA project in another country, 
And, and I think whoever designed that project listened to every consultant that ever wrote about SMEs over the last 30 years, because it, it did everything from early entrepreneurship education to market linkages and everything in between. So there was a BDS component and a linkage component, an incubator component. Um, guess what? O only certain things work. Why? When I came to that project, I had to actually retrofit theory of change to the interventions because I, I don't know. I, th I think whoever designed the project listened too much to consultants. So they thought we had to do everything all at once. And, and what I've learned from working with the private sector for more than 30 years is that focus works. So Link SME is, is, is well designed. I'm, I'm happy about that. It was designed to be basically a, a you know, a one trick pony, if you will. All we basically do is link firms and upgrade them. So our whole thing is focused on the global value chain. We don't have all these ancillary things that might be nice, but they don't have solid theory of change behind them. They don't have solid evidence behind them. So like, like I started out saying, I, you know, I, I didn't compare notes with Natalie, but we ended up in the same place. So we only do the things that have evidence of strong impact. Okay, so, so actually, what, I'm actually advocating for expanding a little bit because we have to get into uh, at least referrals or connections to finance sources to make things work. We can't just work on factory upgrades unless our companies can pay for them because we're not a financing project. We don't have any resources for that. So companies have to pay for what they do. And then we're also looking at kind of a broader management assessment because, and, and this links into another question I see in the chat box, because a lot of the companies have poor communication skills. So they don't connect well with foreign companies. And the, the question was posed just about language. And I heard that just last week from one of our major foreign investors. Their biggest problem in Vietnam is they can't communicate with their supplier. So language is a huge barrier. Yeah, so we really haven't had a lot of pressure to expand out because the project was designed evidentially as well designed. There's a question I want to address about business environment versus you know, firm level intervention. I just need to clarify that uh, values created by enterprises. So if we just do business environment reform, who you don't actually connect with the companies, it's not going to work. So the business environment definitely makes a difference, but you have to implement that at the firm level. So we can't just change policy and, and, and expect businesses to magically pick that up. We actually have to get into the businesses. What I hear over and over again in, in Vietnam is, is there's been very little change over the last two decades. You know, you, you read the same stories about weak local supply chain 10 years ago that you do now. And there have been 100 donor programs since then. So what's the difference? Everyone tells me ours is the first program that's value chain focused that actually work with enterprises at scale. So, so the difference is you have to work with the enterprises to get the value created. You know, you can't just kind of create the environment and expect things to grow. You have to plant the seeds, you have to water them, you have to cultivate. So, so that's what I'm talking about. Um, I don't know, I, I, I'm trying to pick up on um, what else is in there. Uh, I hope, hopefully I've hit, hit the major questions. If, Anastasia, if you want to raise a couple more specific ones, I'd be happy to answer. No, you answered all of them. Thank you very much. Um, and now the next question, um, or sort of group of questions, it's, it's great and I think stimulated, Ron, by your focus on an entrepreneurial and market-oriented model for our programs. Um, so folks are asking, how do we manage uh, expectations of different stakeholders, including the funder and the participants throughout a project? Um, how do we uh, set up the funding so that we can help an activity or especially the market relationships and systems transition to a market-oriented independence and just sustainability of the impact itself and sort of overarching question, how do we drive change to an entrepreneurial mindset? Um, Natalie is not indicating that she wants to start with that. So Ron, do you want to start? <laughs> sure, we, we talk about it every day. I was, I was just in one of the ministries yesterday talking about that. Uh, I hear over and over again from the foreign firms that it's, it is a mind shift that has to be done at, at the SMA level to, to get them to join the global value chain. And, and we can't do that for the entire country at once. So I think in Vietnam, the census says there's 507,000 SMEs. So I don't expect them all to change at once. We, we kind of take a, 
you know, early adopter or, or a, a thought leadership model. And because we're demand driven, we try to expose ourselves broadly. So we want as many SMEs as possible to see what we're doing. And then they self identify. The ones that say, yes, I need to do that will identify themselves. So if we start with a few percent, five percent, ten percent of the market, and they, they become successful, the others will crowd in. But there's no way we can hit the whole market at once. Okay, so we have to start with those where we don't waste our time convincing them that we're right and they have to change. It's, that's a tough way to go. So we just expose ourselves broadly. We do a, a lot of outreach through a lot of different channels, a lot of different partners. So the SMEs know what we're doing and if they're interested and you know, we strike a chord with the type of TA we're doing, if we can do something for them, we pitch benefits. We're very private sector oriented. We come out and we say, you know, what's in it for you? Why should you participate? Here's the benefit you get. And if it strikes the chord with management of the SME, they self-identify. So we're actually starting with the ones that understand them already. So they're the ones that are going to lead the market. They're the early adopters. As they become financially successful, and as they create the business, we'll market that. So we hope others see it and, and they come in because the financial incentive is there. Now, Vietnam is receiving a huge amount of foreign direct investment now. We just need to direct it down to the SME level. Um, thank you very much, Ron. Um, that, with that, I want to move to a sort of measurement question. Um, one of our participants asked, how do we measure impact of technical assistance to firms? Um, I don't know if, Natalie, you want to take a stab, and also Ron, and I can add anything at the end also. Sure. I think, you know, as we lay it out in our report, um, we measured growth in kind of two as aspects, increased employment and increase in profit. So that's kind of how we are um, measuring growth and the indicators that we are using to, within the report, to, um, to outline what, what SME growth means. I don't know, Ron, if you have additional indicators that you measure or collect on the like, SME project. Um, yeah, we're, we're measured by the uh, value of linkages created, and, and again, the, the definition is contract specific. So in, in our contract, a linkage, like I said in my presentation, is not just a matchmaking. We actually have to follow all the way through the cycle. So we have to create a business relationship or facilitate one that didn't exist before and follow that all the way through to delivery. And, and we measure the economic value. So it's basically the, you know, the dollar value of, of, of the linkage you know, facilitated by the project. So that's one way we're measuring. But I think it's pretty common to measure employment and I income, you know, whether that's you know, gross or net. Um, yeah, so, that's, so that's pretty standard. I mean, we're, we're working in the private sector, we're working in economics, it's about money. So we're, we're measuring how much money we actually contribute. And again, we have to be careful about additionality and attribution. We don't want to claim things that, that are a stretch. We actually want to trace the companies all the way through the system. When, when we got them. So we're measuring things like where our uh, beneficiaries come from. So if, for example, we did a supplier day with the American Chamber of Commerce in Hanoi two weeks ago, uh, 65 companies came and displayed their wares, about 400 visitors came. So what did we measure there? We measured how many companies registered online because we have an online registration system, how many entered our system. And then what we want to follow up with is how many companies actually made deals on the spot. How many of those came to fruition? How do they find out about us and, and sign up for the supplier day? Yes, so again, it's, it's longitudinal. There's certain things you can measure on, on the day, but other things you have to follow up. And, and again, that's kind of integrated into our system. That, that's, that's what we ask for. When we give this assistance that USAID is paying for, the give back is that the participants have to give us that. When we get that data back, we analyze it and, and we learn lessons from it, and that teaches us how, how to do better in the future. Thank you very much, Ron. Um, and and I just want to add to that, I went back to a very early slide, and, and those are indeed our center indicator outcomes, um, but that's, of course, very far down the end, at the end of the causal chain. So if you're asking sort of what intermediate uh, outcomes you could measure, of course, that depends on the exact goal of your technical assistance. I can offer some standard ones that are also available uh, at that State Department link at the bottom of that slide that I've pulled up. 
And those include um, the number of firms that we've helped to improve business management practices. Again, that's super vague. You can define those practices as you wish. A more specific and explicit one is um, an indicator that asks how many firms that we have helped uh, meet international product quality standards. So this would be a product, not a service, such as an ISO 9000 or some other uh, similar standard. And um, you can find all those indicator reference sheets at that State Department link, and that includes the one for the full-time equivalent employment. And we're sort of pretty um, agnostic as to uh, how you exactly extract that data from your participant firm, um, but it is very much self-reported and you just take them at their word. And it does require that they have a good handle on their payroll. And it basically means that they have to take some averages for different groups of full-time or part-time or seasonal employees, and then you total it up. So it's by no means a very specific measure. We're not talking a detailed uh, census of the company's payroll, but we do um, ask you to estimate a ballpark uh, based on some estimates. And if you have any further questions about measurement, I would be happy to answer them. You can email me as well. Um, I will also take this opportunity to answer my colleague's question about the journey to self-reliance. Um, that's a great question. Um, some of you may be aware, if you go to uh, usate.gov, I believe it's slash um, self-reliance, um, you can find a link to our self-reliance metrics. And there are quite a few that are related to what we've discussed today um, from finance to the strength of, the, of business regulations um, to super high level ones like uh, GDP per capita and the level of, I believe we measure poverty uh, per capita. Um, of course, those are really, really high level in any intervention, including some of the sample theories of change or Ron's project that we've talked about today would not be the only factor. It would be, you know, small sand, uh, grain of sand uh, on the beach influencing these very high level outcomes. But we should be able to at least articulate a conceptual link to those high level self-reliance metrics. That's my short answer. <laughs> Um, I just make a comment about that um, from a practitioner's point of view. What I found working through the years is that a lot of the field consultants are afraid of ME. You know, so people say, oh, you know, it's someone else's job. ME is like a police department, in, you know, in, in our project. And, and we have to shift our mind as, as development practitioners to where everyone has to understand measurement. Yeah, and, and you have to embed it into your system. Just like we work with a lot of factories, the good factories measure everything. So we have to have that mentality where basically if we're out in the field, we want data, we want to measure everything as we go. It's not someone else's job, it's everyone's job. So yeah, just don't be afraid of M&E, like understand it, use it. You don't have to be a super specialist. It doesn't have to be so technical. You have to understand the logic of what you're doing, why you're doing it, and how you're going to prove that you did. Thank you, Ron. Very important uh, perspective. And um, next, I want to get to a great question that was kind of buried uh, earlier, which is um, from Chris Planick on the research agenda. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, the existing research that's out there. And basically, all of you have asked and identified all the different areas where we said, I don't know. So uh, with that in mind, uh, Natalie, could you recommend some areas for future research that we should focus on. Sure. Yeah, I think we, I mean, we identified a number of different areas. I already touched on the kind of demographic side, you know, women-owned businesses versus male-owned businesses, um, the age of the, of the business owner and things like that. So I've touched on those demographic factors that need additional um, research done, but there are a number of other areas. So thinking through, you know, technology applications, there's obviously, there's new technology being developed all the time, but there's not a lot of impact evaluations on how these technology applications um, change these interventions and, and um, make differences in, in the impact on growth. So that's definitely a new area that, that would be interesting to research. I think there's interest, there'd be interesting research to be done around private equity versus debt. I think we didn't get into um, access to equity or access to um, that kind of financing in our report. We do focus on access to credit, but just because there's not a lot of impact evaluations or, or information out there on uh, the effects of private equity versus debt. Um, other areas, I think, 
you know, there's definitely a lot more to be done around innovation and how that affects growth and the different types of way, uh, ways donors and um, institutions can support innovation. Um, a big piece we talked about is that cost effectiveness piece. There's obviously a lot of information on how much projects cost. There's a lot of information on the impact of those projects, but there's not a lot of information on kind of dollar for impact and what that cost effectiveness looks like. So I think there could be a lot more done uh, when we're developing and implementing these projects to collect that kind of dollar for kind of value for money type uh, data and information as we implement these projects and, and use that as kind of a, a research basis to develop and implement new projects. And then I think the key thing we've, we've been talking about and we mentioned in our report is how to identify that those high growth SMEs. I think it's still kind of um, a black box for people um, trying to find ways to identify those high growth SMEs. I think there have been attempts, but there's no kind of clear consensus on, on who those businesses are. So I think there's a lot, of, a lot more research to be done there as well. Thank you very much, Natalie. And I would just like to reiterate from USAID's perspective um, we were, we chose to limit ourselves based on the methodology um, to experimental and quasi-experimental studies. So that meant that for a lot of topics, which for other reasons, uh, not not uh, sort of natural reasons that haven't just haven't been studied much, um, that's the next step. The logical next step is to try to study them as a development community. But then there are also those very important policy areas, like my colleague Nick mentioned, competition policy, um, and even some others where I, th I imagine blended finance, where you simply cannot have any kind of um, uh, rigorous counterfactual because it's you're changing the whole market, or there are only a few units involved. I, I, I want to emphasize we're not writing those off as well. We can't say anything, so we shouldn't look at them. They are very important, and we should find other ways that are the most rigorous possible to look at them. And um, I, I expect, actually, that you'll see some of these conversations and discussions in USAID's uh, upcoming um, employment strategic framework. It's not, it's not an evidence report, but it will touch upon these important policy areas as well. Um, I yeah, think we. Oh, sorry. Which? Um, and folks, if you have any other additional questions, please continue to um, enter them in the chat room. And I don't know, Ron, if in the meantime you have any closing remarks that you want to make sure that you discuss. Uh, no, I just want to thank you for inviting me. Uh, you know, it's nice to have a mix of perspectives. And you know, I appreciate the research. Uh, in a way, you know, kind of validates what we see empirically in the field. So we reinforce each other. And uh, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about our new project. And again, uh, I think USA tried to incorporate a, a lot of what came out in the study into the design of the project. And if, if anyone wants to follow up, I'd be happy to answer questions afterwards. I think you have my contact. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. And thank you very much, Natalie, for your, your very insightful presentations and um, and for folks uh, at the webinar who have been asking these really great questions, I know we actually didn't cover all of them in great detail. Um, and the, one of those questions includes sort of the impact of mobile technology, um, which again, we just, a lot of those applications have been for micro enterprises and not so much for small and medium enterprises, unless it was something specific to process innovation. Um, you can look at that section of our report. But otherwise, it was, it was basically for want of evidence that we didn't really focus on that question. Um, with that, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And um, you can, again, download those uh, relevant links um, from the left box. And you can also find these resources on our event page after today. 
And I also want to flag for everyone that we will be hosting another Market Links seminar in June, on June 4th, and it will be on political economy analysis and market systems. And with that, I'd like to request that everyone please uh, complete the exit poll if you could, especially if there are other topics that you want to <clears throat> us to cover in the future. Um, any lingering questions and ideas, we would be very interested in seeing them. Thank you.